and we meet and we come together at the crossroads and hopefully at the crossroads we might see each other um, as people who are created in the image of God. They are, you are, we are human beings together. Hi, everybody. It's Linda Laurel. Welcome to a new episode of Our Voices Matter podcast. My guest today is the Reverend Dr. Luke Powery, Dean of the Duke University Chapel and Associate Professor of Homiletics at Duke Divinity School. We have a wide ranging conversation that includes giving us all a little bit of hope in this chaotic, crazy time that we're living in. He offers a perspective not only from that of a theologian and someone who ministers to his congregation on a regular basis, but also as a Black man in America. He happens to be the first Black dean of the Duke University Chapel and the first Baptist dean of the Duke University Chapel. A bit more about his background, he received his Bachelor of Arts in Music from my alma mater, Stanford University, his Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary, and his Doctor of Theology from Emmanuel College at the University of Toronto. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. I'll see you on the other side. Well, Luke, it is such a pleasure to have an opportunity to talk with you. I'm so thankful that we were recently introduced to each other by a mutual friend. And um, I just am in awe of of what you are doing um, at Duke as the dean of the chapel. Um, give us just a, a little bit of, a, of an understanding of what your mission is um, as the Duke of the chapel and what's, what is the message that you're trying to get out to people today? Sure. Um, you know, in that role as the, the dean of uh, Duke University Chapel, I serve as the, the religious figurehead at the institution. Um, so people would often see me praying at commencement and other university ceremonies. But I think it's at Duke. Um, the, the chapel itself is at the center of the campus and it is at its heart. It is in many ways represents the spiritual center um, of the university, not only its sort of historical roots, but its actual life um, today. Our motto is bridging faith and learning. We have many students of a variety of faith traditions, a variety of religious traditions. And what we hope is that students in particular, but faculty and staff would also find a way to integrate their spiritual life with their intellectual life and ethical life. So ultimately people are whole human beings, that they're living integrative lives, which really ends up being lives of integrity. Um, and, and so, you know, we do that through our various services. We do that through student engagement, community engagement out in the community with nonprofits. We do it through our sacred music and the arts programs. Um, and then all of our religion, what we call religious life at Duke are all of the chaplaincies or campus ministries from the Buddhist chaplaincy, the Hindu chaplain, uh, the rabbi, the imam, across the various Christian spectrums to help students um, in particular really become whole, find meaning and purpose in their lives. Um, and, and to say, you know, I can't compartmentalize my life. I'm this, mm. I, I do this in the chemistry lab and I'm this outside of the lab, but how do you bring your whole self together? And um, ultimately, our vision is to respond, what we say, respond to God's all-inclusive love. And ultimately, we hope to bring a message of, of love, of hope. Hope is one of our values uh, in our strategic uh, plan and um, bring hope and love and, and ultimately um, a sense of working to bring people together. You know, the, the, the chapel itself is cruciform. Obviously it's, it's within the outside of, in, within the Christian traditions, but it's at the crossroads is what I like to say. We are at the crossroads, meaning that's the place where all kinds of people meet, all kinds of traditions meet. 
and we meet and we come together at the crossroads and hopefully at the crossroads, we might see each other um, as people who are created in the image of God. They are, you are, we are human beings together. So that's I some of that. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I love that imagery of, of being at the crossroads. Um, mm -hmm. So much of what you said resonates with me because I think that, you know, regardless of whether people um, who are watching and listening to this um, consider themselves to be quote unquote religious, or they might be of a faith other than Christianity. Um, but I, you know, what you're talking about, this, this universal message of unity and recognizing each other, you know, in God's image as, as all being the same as members of, of the human race um, and, and trying to find connections and ways of bringing us together, which seems so increasingly difficult um, right now with everything that is going on in our world from the tent, the pandemic to social justice, racial unrest, you know, the, the list goes on and on. Um, what are, what are you seeing and hearing from, um, those who, who are seeking your counsel and guidance at, mm -hmm. at this time? How are, how are people feeling? Are they, are you getting different vibes, different questions? than yeah. you were, say, this time a year ago? Mm, that's a wonderful question. I will say this, if I, if I ponder even within the last week <laughs> and really phone calls from across the nation and literally from around the world just in the last day, people are hurting. And, and this may not even have anything to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. There are people who are who have died, loved ones who just they had cancer. I mean, these are the things we were dealing with before. Uh, other people who have attempted suicide, um, others whose marriages have been broken apart. Um, it's like real life is still happening. <laughs> but the pandemic, in some ways, these little deaths what I call the brokenness that we may experience, not even sort of dying and being buried in the grave. The pandemic has heightened the awareness of our mortality in some ways, our brokenness, our yearning for hope, our yearning for healing, our yearning for meaning. You know, what is my life about really? What am I, like these questions, because of the loss, because of, of the pain, um, that pe people are on the flip side of that seeking um, answers, seeking like hope and, and peace in their life because the pandemic, I think, has heightened our awareness that, you know what, we are in some ways, um, <laughs> we're dying every single second, you know, and even as we speak, someone is somewhere, you know, dying. That, that is the reality. But I think that reality of our dying should help us in our living. I mean, for me, it's sobering, but it's also inspiring in the sense of it's a call to ask myself, what am I really about? Who do I want to be? What do I want to do or what should I be doing? And as I engage others in society, wherever I may find myself on Duke's campus or out in the community or or elsewhere, what do I want to say? How, how should I be um, engaging my children and, and my wife at home? For me, the pandemic has done all of that, a kind of reassessment of my own life on Earth. And I and what I have heard, I think people, the masks, mask wearing that many are doing is a sign, a visual sign of more of our mortality. A year ago, we didn't have that. And I think there's a level of, of seriousness perhaps, um, that I, that I hear, um, of, of people's sense that, you know what, I have this one life on earth, <laughs> I'm mortal. And what do I want to do with it? What am I, how am I going to spend my time and my resources? That's what I hear. 
uh, coming through stronger uh, than a year ago. And for those who are are hurting and you know really struggling to um, just survive, um, wh- what do you say to give them hope? What what are what are the how do you find the words? Because there's so yeah. many people right now that are literally hanging on by a thread, yeah. and they they don't know what to do or how to feel that things are going to get better. Yeah. You know, for me, um, I mean, that is a word that has come up much during um, this year, hope in, in sense of people are looking for hope. And what I've discovered, or maybe I've been reminded of is how deeply communal hope is. I mean, ultimately, obviously, I'm an ordained minister and I would say hope in God, like the psalmists, you know, ultimately. But if I think about what generates hope in me, it often has to do. There's this deep sense of community. And what I mean by that is if we think about music, I've I've turned to listening to music during this pandemic more and more. I have a music background, but in terms of listening to reggae or listening to gospel music or other genres, even jazz, Music is something that is often outside of us, right? These are other musicians. These are, they're they're the community of people from a different part of the world or from our town, but it's outside of me and their sounds and their instrumentation inspires me in some way. Or if I think about the book, what I think of as the book of nature, creation, trees, the birds singing, Again, it's outside of me, right? It's a deep sense of community. Or if it's something I read in a, in a, a, a poem, one of James Baldwin's poems, um, or Howard Thurman, uh, Howard Thurman's The Growing Edge poem. Again, it's someone else who's inspiring me or, or generating a sense of hope. My family, relationships, our families, our friends, our colleagues, that that are there to encourage us again it's someone outside of us so for me i've come to this deep awareness again of how much hope is generated outside of me or from the community i I call it the community of creation and um and so for people i also help remind others not only the deep communal sense but i would say Um, It's like Pauli Murray, who was from Durham, Um, the first um, I believe she was the first African-American woman, Episcopal priest, a civil rights lawyer. Pauli Murray has this wonderful quote in a poem, and she says, hope is a song in a weary throat. Or J. Alfred Smith, who was the retired pastor uh, from um, Allen Temple Baptist Church in Oakland. He has in a sermon, he says, hope is a tiny sprout growing in cracked concrete. Like the imagery of the weary throat, the imagery of the cracked concrete tells me that hope does not delete our hardships and our hurts, but hope rises out from the weary throat, from the cracked concrete, from the valley of dry bones, from the ashes of despair. We, we can say it in so many ways and that hope um, it, and, and in those two um, phrases, think about how small hope is. I mean, the tiny sprout growing in cracked concrete, like the, the vast suffering that we see, the devastation of all of the de- deaths from COVID-19 is huge. It may even be bigger than the hope we sense and feel. But there are tiny sprouts growing all around us, right? The birds are still singing. Leaves may be falling off now because it's the fall, but they will grow again. And, And so for me, it's this beautiful understanding that hope, if I take St. Augustine from the Confessions, who says, after his mother died because he didn't want to cry and and weep for her death because she was a woman of faith but on the next day after he buried her he said that his tears flowed so freely that on that they formed a pillow 
and on them his heart rested. And I think in so many ways, the tears that have been, that have flowed, the trail of tears historically, uh, the tears from Lift Every Voice and Sing, that hymn, we have come over a way that with tears has been water, watered. That there's a sense that the tears, it's on them. They form a pillow and on them, hope, our hope rests. It's the foundation of our human existence. And there's something honest and truthful about the pain and the challenges that we've been enduring. But yet I remember the spirituals. And sometimes... If I think about what W.E.B. Du Bois did in The Souls of Black Folk, at the beginning of each chapter, he has an epigraph of e at the beginning of each chapter. It's just the melodic line of a spiritual. It's no words. And I think often maybe that's all we have are, are the melodies, are the tunes, are the groans, are the sounds. But that we still sound something <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is a sign of hope. The whole idea of um, feeling the pain and allowing the tears to flow is, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, and, and I think it's what I believe, too, that you, you, have to, you have to confront the pain. You have to experience it and allow it to um, do what it does, to feel whatever it is you're feeling. If you hold the tears in as opposed to allowing them to flow, it's so much more difficult to get to the point where you actually have hope. That's I, I, am I right? I, I believe so. Yeah. The tears. I mean, there are people who have done research on this. A UCLA um, psychiatrist, I believe, about tears and the different kinds of tears and basically how it's healthy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, physiologically and emotionally and and um, I do think there is something and, and, and what's interesting about tears the eastern church even the ancient eastern church world would talk about the gift of tears and 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 what I think I've discovered again is how the, the tears, you know, I, I'll just take a, one little piece of literature <laughs> from the prophet Jeremiah. We, there's a spiritual there as a balm in Gilead because they straighten out the question that Jeremiah asks, is there no balm in Gilead? But in that story, Jeremiah has so much sorrow over what's happening to his people that he he tears up. He says his, his tears flowed. So his, his tears, his head was like a spring of water, his eyes, a fountain of tears. Mm -hmm. What is interesting to me is earlier in that whole narrative, there's the image that says that God is the fountain of living water. And here we have Jeremiah whose head is a spring of water, his eyes a fountain of tears. It's that the divine presence is in our tears. Mm -hmm. And so, which the tears are not just a sign of sorrow necessarily and of the pain and the struggle, but they are also a sign of the hope. They are also a sign of, of you know, somebody can cry and it might be, they might be celebrating something. There might be right. tears of joy. Right. Right. And, I used to and, tell my daughter when, when I would cry, she say, mommy, why are you crying? I say, happy tears, baby. Happy tears. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so there is a sense that our tears might actually be an expression of hope mm. in an odd way. It's what Al Rabba told a Princeton historian um, once in his little memoir um, called sad. He called it sorrowful joy, but he was talking about African-American spirituality in particular and he talked about this sad joyfulness. And I, and, I, and I think in many ways for all people, that is often true, right? This yeah, yeah, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. And, and I think there's another, another element and it just flashed across my mind thinking about um, something that, that Brene Brown says, I'm a huge Brene Brown fan. Okay. And one of the things that she says is that, you know, 
if if we if we don't confront our own stuff, although she says a little bit more colorfully, so I won't say that. <laughs> but if we don't confront our own stuff, okay, we end up working it out on other people. Oh. And so if we're not allowing ourselves to feel the pain um, and then deal with it, whatever that means, to work it out within ourselves, we end up w- projecting it and working it out on others. And I think that that is such a, a powerful way to look at where we are as a society, because we right now, it, it, it appears to me that we are projecting our own stuff onto other people. And it's that person's fault. And it's, it, mm-hmm. it's blame. It's the blame game. Right. Mm-hmm. And so we're blaming each other for whatever we haven't worked out in our own lives Mm -hmm. and we're projecting it onto them and saying, it's your fault that my life isn't what I want it to be, blah, blah, blah. I think that's a a component of, of where we are. What, Mm -hmm. what is your take on that? Yeah. I mean, there is something about (laughs) just, I have a friend years ago, over 20 years ago, he said, check yourself before you wreck yourself. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. And and before and you wreck yourself or somebody else or somebody else, or somebody else. That's yeah. right. Right. And so it's like you're bleeding over others, right? Your pain, your mm-hmm. wounds um, spill over to other people. And and I and I do think that there is this is a time for the inner work or the introspection um, that people talk a lot about self-care during this time. And I think maybe that's a part of the self-care, right? To care for ourselves enough, to love ourselves enough, to do the work that is needed Mm -hmm. to seek the healing even for ourselves. So that the brokenness that we have experienced would not lead to breaking other people up. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. and, And so, you know, there is, there is a sense that, you know, we're, we can point fingers at others, but again, we're all mortals. We don't see our own, you know, the log in our own eye. Right. Um, right. We don't see our own. And, and so there's a recognition. I mean, to me, I always come back to this and this is really thinking about extending the grace to others, the same grace you want extended to yourself. Exactly. Thank right? you. That's one of my favorite words is grace. Yeah. You know, we have to give each other grace. And one of the things that um, that I'm trying to do with this podcast is to help people see glimpses of themselves in others and in mm-hmm. someone that they consider to be the other. Mm-hmm. Right. Because mm-hmm. we're all somebody else's other at yeah. one time or another for whatever yeah. reason. But the 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 thread of humanity is is always still there it's just that we don't see it or we don't choose to see it yeah and so uh, you know that's what i i'm trying to you know figure out okay how do we how do we help people understand that that you know i am you and you are me we want the same things and you know we we all bleed the same way and um you know this this skin color thing that we got going on and the, you know, the, you know, I don't like you because you, you believe that, you know, and I believe this Mm -hmm. and then I demonize you for this and you demonize me for that. And what, (laughs) help me, help me, Reverend, (laughs) (laughs) help me, please (laughs) help me understand where do we go? How do we deal with this? Yeah. I mean, for me, where I'm at today and where I have been, I think in the last several months with everything stirring and, and I was on sabbatical before coming back in July um, to Duke is really coming to remember what it means to be human mm-hmm. and meaning human, humus from the Latin meaning from the earth, um, from the soil, from the ground, Um, Religious folks might say uh, during the season of Lent after Mardi Gras, 
uh, on Ash Wednesday, to dust you've come and to dust you will return. So it's for me, it's coming back to the fundamentals of recognizing we're all human beings, meaning we are all dust, actually. And when we talk about common ground, the common ground is that we are all from the ground. <laughs> we are all humans mm -hmm. before any of the categories, the, you know, the adjectives, the, the, the adjectives that other people, right. Whether it's your political party, whether it's your race, whether it's your denominational affiliation, you know, it could be your sports, you know, allegiances, these adjectives are often used to objectify people and to categorize people and then to place them into a group that you can either accept or reject. And, right. then, and then when you are otherized, that you're often demonized. And then exactly. historically, you're destroyed. You're wiped mm -hmm. out. You're, you're, you're written off as a non-human and so it's a reclamation for of our common humanity as you as you you know the thrust of of your work and often we miss that it's 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 often humans who are like me who think like me who look like me those are the people that i will accept rather than those who actually might give me a, a larger sense of what it means to be human or what it means to be a, a, a child of God, that somehow we see the beauty of God in our collective humanity. And when certain people are taken off the human, you know, uh, are seen as de are dehumanized, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we don't have the fullest sense of beauty. Exactly. Okay. So here's, I, I, I want to pick up on, on that mm -hmm. because I, I, I want to talk about race. Um, so you, you are the first black Dean of the Duke university chapel, correct? Yes. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. Okay. First black so, and first Baptist. <laughs> first black and first Baptist. Okay. So I was reading a post on LinkedIn the other day and someone had posted something about um, uh, a black woman who had been elevated to, I, I don't even remember now exactly what the title was, but she was the first black woman to be in this role. And one of the comments from, I assume it was a white gentleman who said, well, her accomplishments are her accomplishments. So why, do, why does the color, why does it have to be the first black? Mm. And then, okay. And so then the, the black people who were part of this, this conversation were trying to explain to him um, why it's important to acknowledge when someone who, who previously or when a, a race or a, a group of people who have not previously achieved a certain level of success for whatever reason, but especially for reasons of race, it's a big deal. Yeah. And so that's why when you talk about being the first, it, you know, it, it, people want to say that, right? So I want to ask you about being the first black dean at Duke University Chapel mm -hmm. and what that experience has been like for you. You've been there for six years now. And whether you have seen a, um, a difference in how you were first um, accepted and treated six years ago when you were brand spanking new <laughs> versus now six years later. And then I got a whole bunch of follow up questions after that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been there. I've been there eight years, actually. Um, eight years. I'm yeah, sorry. Eight. I said, no, 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 no. It's That's fine. why I want to correct me. OK, it feels like six, but um, <laughs> but it's been eight years. You know, okay. there is so much. To yeah, be I bet. I and I'm bet. actually writing in some of my writing that I'm working on. I'm kind of weaving in some stories and different episodes because a lot has happened at Duke beyond my during my eight years here that are related mm -hmm. to race. Mm. I mean, the Robert E. Lee statue was removed from the front of the chapel. A noose was hung in 20, I forget what, a few years ago 
um, when President Broadhead was still there, was a mat. Um, it this place was going crazy. Mm -hmm. um, other incidents that have occurred a lot circling around race. Um, and so I had come in thinking, you know, look, I've been at these institutions like Duke and Princeton Seminary and that kind of University of Toronto. And it's like I'm coming in and I had to remind people sometimes because of so much of the first language. I am human. <laughs> I am a human dean of the chapel. <laughs> that's, that's right. Thank you. So there's yes. that. There's that. Because what happens is I'm racialized when somebody if, if that's all I'm getting. He's the first he's the black dean in the chapel or the first black. Mm -hmm. All of it, I'm mm -hmm. I'm racialized, mm -hmm. which for some will dehumanize me or it, with the stereotypes, it makes. Well, he's only going to he's only going to dive into black literature or, you know, black stuff, interests, mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. kinds of things that happen all over and in the academy, most certainly. But I, at the same time, so what exactly to what you pointed out, I have lived it in the sense. I get it. I had someone when I first got here, literally first couple of days, leaving the chapel, going to the parking lot. Someone jumped out of their car, African-American woman says, you don't know me, Dean Powery, um, but you don't know what this means. That you are here. This is somebody from the black community in Durham, grew up in Durham. All of her degrees are at Duke. And I don't think I had the sense of all of that, but I had different people say to me, this is amazing. They could, you know, <laughs> that for that building and, and all of right. that history because of the history. And, but what I realized is I understand it, but it's also, Look, I'm Luke, I'm, but there's a responsibility that comes with it. Right. Because this is not even about me. This is about the larger story. I put it this way. It's the larger story God is writing. It's, and, and to the point, people can say, wow. In, in the sense of, look, people from a people that were oppressed and dehumanized, Right now, your leader is placed at the center, the spiritual center of this major research university. For folks who have the long view, it can be seen as amazing. But the question becomes, what do I do with the resources we have? How do we leverage the resources right for the common good? And it's right. not about me in the end. Right. It's 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 basically how do I serve? <laughs> With any kind of power, deemed power, what do I do with it? How do I wield it? But I, I think at first there was a lot of, to your question, a lot of questions. First Black, but also First Baptist. So that brings a lot of baggage um, in the South because there's, and all over because there's all kinds of Baptists. <laughs> you know, let's be honest. <laughs> So I was I'm ordained with the progressive National Baptist from a church in New Jersey, which is the the denomination that Gardner Taylor and Martin Luther King Jr. really spearhead and and spun off from, from National Baptist Convention because there was disagreements around how the civil rights movement was to be handled and all of that. So mm -hmm. I think early on and being in the South, which matters. I mean, there was just, you know, people, a level of trust had to come over time. But there were questions about what is he doing in the pulpit? Why is he singing? Why is he doing this with words? And, you know, a lot of that was it was a new cross-cultural experience for many. Let's call it that, you know, because people had not been exposed to certain kinds of preaching, certain ecclesial traditions. And so for me... It, it, it could have felt in some ways like an interrogation, you know, mm. a cultural interrogation, a hyper interrogation even, which sometimes happens of blackness, let's be honest, in our institutions of higher learning. But I took that grace is a good word because it was grace that allowed me to recognize it was the support, to be honest, the people from the Durham community that would, I wouldn't even see on a Sunday morning, but they were cheering me on. I knew I would see them and say, I'm praying for you. We're proud of you. We're, 
And and then, of, of course, my wife would, you know, say, <laughs> keep me alive. But there was a sense that this is not even about me. Right. That's what helped me has helped me stay here now. And I'm really here now. And what I mean is with any leader and organization and people, it takes time to build trust. It takes time to understand one another's voices. Right. Listening becomes a key and learning and loving. Right. Listening is a, a posture of loving, actually. And and to be able. And so through that eight years um wow i mean so much has transpired um i've learned so much i've grown so much and i would say there's a greater understanding and and there's an alignment with how the university somebody can look now and say wow the university is going in these directions which has you know been a gradual powery's here now and there's a, a real alignment with some of our values at the chapel um under my leadership and where the university's going and so things that's a good word things have come into alignment yeah at this moment so you, so you talked about where the university is now and the direction that it's moving in um talk a little bit about the anti-racism Institute and the effort that's happening on campus. Sure. President Price, in the wake of 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 the death of George Floyd, President Vincent Price, uh, president of Duke, um, put out a statement. You know, presidents normally put out statements um, at these kinds of national atrocities. And in this statement, it was either the first one or the second one. He made a commitment. He put it in writing about Duke becoming an anti-racist institution. And that's across the board in curriculum, thinking about faculty, thinking about processes, systems across every unit, across every school. And what has transpired from that is there's a website, you know, where it's supposed to keep track. You know, it's going to put out what each school or unit says they're going to do and then hold, have some accountability. I mean, those of us who report to him have now been asked in our fiscal year priorities for our organizations to include anti-racist priorities, anti-racism and equity priorities, mm -hmm. because it's about accountability. Right. And so it has to do it's multi pronged. His last statement kind of lays out the themes there. It's there's a level of students that has to do with students, a level of governance, a level of engaging the community. Um, and so there are all these layers to the approach, multi layered approach that that Duke is taking. And it's just beginning. I mean, it, it is so now and it's not just beginning. Let me correct. Duke from its beginning which it's celebrating its centennial in 2024. There has been a gradual move. I mean, this is not okay. like just coming out of nowhere. It is built right. on the history, right? Mm -hmm. My coming, other people coming. The, right. look, Duke has moved mm -hmm. throughout the mm -hmm. history. This is building on that and now being more strategic, more explicit, mm -hmm. I would say, mm -hmm. and much more university-wide initiative right. and commitment um, around anti-racism and equity. In, in the wake of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna exactly. Taylor, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm curious, before the president announced this initiative, were you involved in any behind the scenes talks with him about this with the university or were others or how, how did it come about? Do you know? You know, I was on sabbatical. So this is part oh, that's of <laughs> right. That's right. You were on sabbatical yeah. during that um, time. Yeah. And some of these, you know, some of I, I started kind of slowly joining some meetings in a senior leadership group, but I was still on sabbatical. Um, and so that would have been with his executive leadership. I'm sure, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. that and his some of his his communications team. Um, but it's clear that these deaths were the impetus. Um, so, but once again, I think the heightens, the COVID-19 pandemic brought us. Heightens second, everything. Yeah. 
So I'm curious about what your personal reaction was, um, aside from the obvious horror of George Floyd, as not just as a as an ordained mm -hmm. minister, but also as a black man in America, because when you are driving down the street anywhere in America with your black skin, nobody, you know, knows your Stanford education, your, you know, yada, all the all the degrees and who you are, what you do, that you're a, an upstanding nationally recognized leader in this in this country because to many you're just another black man in america mm -hmm. so what what does all of this mean to you on a personal level what we have been going through these last several months yeah. when i when i saw the george floyd um you know episode you know, I thought it's like Will Smith said, it's, you know, this is nothing new. It's just being filmed now. So that reality came, you know, it's like, you know, it's another one. And to be honest, the George Floyd episode, I didn't have any words. I went, the funny thing is I started writing poetry for the first time. Um, and I wrote a couple of poems just to myself, not not to get out what was in me. <laughs> I didn't I couldn't I couldn't just do it in prose. I had to put it in poetic form um, to try to express the inexpressible. Um, and so for me, it was I mean, it was the inhumanity on display. You know, um, it was I think it's part of what's driving me towards the human, this move toward the human, because I did have people reach out to me, like text me from uh, different friends or colleagues from across the country and post George Floyd. And I can understand that in a certain way. But why are you texting me now? Right. Why not text me just any time? And. I should be texting you too, because a human being died unjustly, not just because he was a black man, a human man died. And so I had, that's why I turned to poetry. I had so many things that I, I felt like I just needed to get out on the page. Is there, um, is there something that you could share with us that you would be willing to share or that you have off the top of your I don't head. have it off the top you of my head. You don't have the top of your head. That's the, but that's the, yeah, but I have one that I believe they said George Floyd, and that's just one that comes to mind that he was, um, was it that he was, there was something about eight minutes and 46 seconds mm -hmm. was the time of, what was that exactly? It was, it was the, that was the amount of time. That was the length of time that the yeah. officer had his knee, knee on, on, the, on okay. George's neck. So I wrote I wrote a poem um, related to that, you know, about I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wouldn't be able to quote. But there, there were different one line from a one I called space. I, I will say this. This is one something. And I called it space because it was around the same time that NASA was sending some sort of spacecraft. It was the first for a spacecraft around the same time that the protests, so it was after George Floyd was killed, but protests were happening. I mean, it was, yeah. and it was the irony, you have all the protests, you have buildings being burned, set on fire, and you have the celebration of a spacecraft going up <laughs> yeah I, I this thing was called space this poem and i have a line in there about um about our technology has outpaced our humanity and that we can go to space but we can't make space for one another ah oh. Oh, my so, gosh. That gives me chills. Say, this, that, say that again. Say that whole line again. Our technology has outpaced, has our, outpaced humanity. our humanity. 
and we can go to space, but can't make, can't space, make space for one another. For each other. Oh, yeah. So wow. this is where all of this brought me a kind of place of mourning, I would call it. Um, and not even thinking about myself. I mean, just the collective reality of what is the United States, you know, of America, which is really the divided states. So divided, you know, it's in splinters, which maybe has been the case. You know, things are now just out there. Um, but, it, you know, there was a d- deep sense of mourning and, um, you know, I, you know, th- th- that somebody would take a knee. I mean, that's the other thing as some of the poems pointed to take a knee on a man's neck and then all of the talk about taking a knee related to the flag. Exactly. And then other people take a knee to pray, like just this whole idea of why do we kneel? (laughs) There's just, you know, um, so it called forth so many things for me um, in a poetic way, but a kind of sadness and melancholy about the realities of that we're still here in 2020. And, and, and I would say talking about being here, you know, there's one story of early on, I'm, I'm, I have it in um, a chapter of a book that should be coming out hopefully in the next year or so, but of a man, what you said with all the, the pedigrees, this, this is the other piece a man I went to have lunch with who was very senior. I mean, you know, see maybe in his nineties or eighties and in a wheelchair. And this was early on. And this was someone who really adored Princeton theological seminary, which is, you know, one of the oldest, if not the theological institution in the United States of America, 1812. And, um, esteemed theological institution. He was a graduate from the early days and then um, loved Duke Chapel, all of that. But he lived in a senior home and I went to see him. And at, as we were eating lunch, uh, this man said out of nowhere, I mean, he knew the biography. He said, do you think you would get into Stanford um, today? Or do you think, no, the first question was, do you think you got into Stanford because of your color? Then I couldn't, then I'm eating. I didn't, I did not say anything. I couldn't believe it was, he says, do you think, then he asked, what were your SAT scores? Oh my God. And he says, no, he did not. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And then he said, um, and I didn't even answer him, but he said, oh, you probably wouldn't get in today. So for me, here I was for some who prize this this pulpit and this university chapel for whatever reason. Right. For some, it is the apex of whatever their hopes and dreams are. You come. It doesn't matter. This that this is the other piece. People can say, you know, a generation, a certain generation, you know, because he was much older. And I, I, I don't buy that. I think young people, younger generations, you know, the you're always suspect. You're often suspect. Let's put it that way. Often, regardless of the pedigree, but you're suspect yep. because of uh, the color of your skin. Exactly. And I think that was a sobering experience and reminder that no matter what you may do and, and no matter who you may be, <laughs> you know, um, those kinds of things will happen, you know. So I, I think such an important story to share. I mean, yeah. oh, my gosh. I was saying this, something very similar to this, you know, relating an incident and and just saying, you know, in the eyes of some people, because of the color of my skin, I'm always going to be, and I'm going to use the word, a nigger, Mm -hmm. because I've been called it before. Mm -hmm. You know, even in my 
role as a news anchor. So what? You know, I mean, a, a, a skinhead started writing me these um, very um, defamatory, threatening letters. And I had FBI, you know, mm. a whole bunch of, you know, escorts and stuff for months because this person was threatening me just because I'm black. You know, it doesn't matter that I went to Stanford. It doesn't matter that I, you know, have a have a master's degree from the zoo. It doesn't matter that I have worked my you know what off to get where I am. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that I've done everything that society says I'm supposed to do, right? right? To be accepted and successful and blah, 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 blah. And you do all of that and still it's not enough. That's right. So what are we supposed to do? So I, I have to ask you, mm -hmm. how did you respond? <laughs> what did you say? No, you know, I didn't say a thing. You said nothing. Because I didn't have anything to say. I just wanted that lunch to be over. And we were because I could not believe it. I was the irony is I basically was doing a pastoral visit. I was doing him a favor because someone asked me because of the connections with Princeton Seminary and Duke and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. OK, mm -hmm. I'll go I'll go visit him. Why not? I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the, for that to come was really a sobering um, experience and yeah. uh, a reminder, you know, and but I don't. You know, I. <laughs> I will not. It's what Bob Marley says. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. And I think that's how I, I live. I don't I'm going to do what I sense, you know, God's calling is. And I'm going to be who God wants me to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to do my work and do the best work that I can through many dangers, toils and snares. We're talking about grace. That's that's how I. You know, through it all, Andre Crouch, <laughs> through it all, <laughs> through it all. you know, and I think that's through it all. the reality. When I think about the spirituals and my work on the spirituals, I get inspired because I, I think about what the ancestors went through. And yet those songs, those pearls of wisdom still are being sung all over the world, like to teach us the unlettered you know, the folks that untaught, mm. unknown, unnamed, as James Weldon Johnson says, are still speaking and teaching. So I get inspired by their sense of resiliency, perseverance, faith yeah. of those before me. And, and again, it's the communal hope. It's that long view to know that I'm not just here for Luke. I'm not here because of me. All of the folks that have come before me that have paved the way. Um, keep me, reminds me that I'm not alone. All of the cloud of witnesses, you know, that have surround me, that, that helps me wake up the next day to move the next, you know, um, step forward on the next day when things like that happen. And mm -hmm. because I know, again, it's not about me. It's about the larger narrative that God is writing, um, for the ultimately the redemption of the world. And, and, and mm -hmm. I am, I'm inspired by that. And that's why I press forward. And maybe I'm just a kind of glass half full kind of guy and not glass half empty in the mm -hmm. sense of even the anti-racism language or, or it tells you what you're against. Right. And then you're you're you are being defined in your energy within the rubric of racism um, or even within the rubric of race, which is a social construct. I'm more about, OK, what you're against. But I want to know, what are you for? What are you for? And that's where I'm leaning. I'm leaning towards what am I for? And I'm going to go ahead and write it, sing it, preach it, do it, work it. <laughs>
That's I am right there with you. you know? I am right there with you. Absolutely. <laughs> oh my gosh. I could, I could have a conversation with you every day, all day. My goodness. you <laughs> promise me you'll, you'll come back on the show. I, I, I really, there's so much more I want to explore mm-hmm. with you. Um, I would love but that. But man, um, so what, what would be the, the, the last thing you you want to leave our audience with is we are, you know, approaching the how we're in the holiday season and mm. this pandemic is raging and, you know, the president's refusing to concede the election and, it, you oh, know, yeah. people are still like this. And what what can you leave <laughs> us with? <laughs> Just, just a, you know, no, no small ass. Just, just tell us, <laughs> tell us something, right? <laughs> to help us get out of bed tomorrow morning and keep putting yeah. one foot in front of the other. Oh, well, I, I'm going to leave with a, a quote um, from Emily Dickinson, the poet. Okay. On hope. Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. So for me is hope is still singing, you know, through it all, hope is still rising. (laughs) And so I hope that we all can tune our hearts and our ears to that melody in the days ahead. Amen. Amen to that. (laughs) Reverend Luke Powery, thank you so very much for this just wonderful, enlightening, inspiring Mm -hmm. conversation. Um, I so appreciate you taking the time and and I look forward to continuing this conversation for sure. Uh, Thank you so much for having me and it's great to be with you. Thank you so much. You be well, okay? Okay, thank you so much. If you'd like to learn more information about the Duke Chapel and Dr. Powery, and if you'd like to follow him and hear more about the work that he's doing, you can find the links to everything in the show notes on our Voices Matter podcast.com. In the meantime, thank you very much for giving him permission to speak and for having the courage to listen with an open mind. Be well. See you next time.